Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of the Azure Festive Tech Calendar. Today I'll be speaking to you on lessons from recent Azure vulnerability disclosures. But before we get into the topic, quick information about myself. So my name is David Okeade. I'm the EMEA Azure CTO at Palo Alto Network. So I have a decade of experience in cybersecurity, including consultancy, architecture design and implementation. So I've also authored um, a few books on cloud security, which I'll share some of them with you in a few minutes. So Palo Alto Networks, I believe that we have one of the most comprehensive codes to cloud security platform out there. So if that's something that you're looking at, you may want to check out some of our um, solutions and some of our products that we have um, to offer. So um, I'm also an Azure MVP, and this is my third year of being an Azure MVP, and that's something that I'm grateful for. As I mentioned earlier, I've got two books on Azure security. So the first one, Pen Testing Azure for Ethical Hackers, uh, which I co-wrote with Carl Fossine, who works for NetSpy, based out of Oregon. So amazing Anson book on pen testing Azure. So the second book that I've written um, is on Microsoft Azure security technology. So this covers a much more holistic view of security of the Azure Cloud Platform and the services from identity security, network security, container security, or security, data security, database security, and just overall general platform security. So it's a very interesting book that you may want to check out. In terms of the agenda for today, we'll start by looking at the current state of things, where things are, we're talking about learning lessons from recent vulnerabilities. What are those vulnerabilities? We'll get some information about them and also some threat actors that some of our team at Palo Alto Network Unit, Unit 42 have been tracking. We'll get some information about that. We'll look at some very interesting information on identity security for the Azure Cloud. I think you're going to get some really interesting information from that. And finally, we'll talk about what I believe should be the principle for security architecture and design for the Azure Cloud platform going forward, which is zero trust with zero exceptions. But we'll break that down in terms of how we can actually start implementing some of these principles in our architecture and in our design. So let's get into the conversation. The Azure platform has an enormous attack surface. We have three cloud platforms, the Azure Public Cloud, Azure US Government, and Azure China Cloud. And we have over 178 services. And we've had multiple announcements that's been made by Microsoft in terms of feature announcements for this year. So the number that we currently have on the screen shows about 257 announcements, but that's now out of date. So the latest um, count is over 300 feature announcements, whether for GA or whether for preview that's been announced for the Azure platform in the last 12 months. So that's massive number of changes that are coming through to the platform. Microsoft has definitely been very busy. So um, in terms of the Azure attack surface, we know that when developers write code, mistakes happen. And the cloud vendors like Azure are no exception to this. When you have a combination of a massive code base, you have rapid development velocity, you have large numbers of contributors, you are going to get security vulnerabilities, you're going to get security mistakes. So the chat that you have on the right hand side is actually from the GitHub Octoverse 2020 security report, where they looked at a massive number of um, code repositories. And what I found was that the um, potential vulnerabilities found in the code is proportional to the lines of code that's written. And the, again, the cloud vendors like Azure are no exception to this. So in terms of why we're here, in the last one and a half years, we've had 13 high impact vulnerabilities disclosed in the past, again, in the past one and a half years for the Azure Cloud Platform. So we have, we've had Chaos DB, we've had Azure Escape, which was discovered by our own Unit 42 team at Palo Alto Networks. We've had, oh my God, we've had Not Legit, Cred Manifest discovered by Carl Fossen, who was my co-author on the pen testing Azure for Edco Like a Book. We've had Extra Replica, we've had Auto Warp, We've had Syn Labs, with, we've had Fabriscape, which was again discovered by our own Unit 42 team at Palo Alto Networks. 
if I had Fabri XS, XSS, so both Fabriscape and Fabri XSS impacted the same Azure service, the service fabric. We've had an Arch enabled Kubernetes privileged escalation vulnerability discovered by Microsoft themselves. And more lately, we've had Cosmis and we've had Accessed. Um, so these are brand new vulnerabilities that were just announced in the past few weeks. So here is the very interesting part of that is that about six of these are cross tenant vulnerabilities and those six um, are the ones that are marked on the screen now. Speaking of cross tenant vulnerabilities, uh, cross tenant vulnerabilities is speaking about a vulnerability that allows an attacker to bypass the tenant isolation mechanism. So one of the key pillars of security in the cloud is the ability of the cloud provider to isolate customer workloads from each other. So even though my workload is running or maybe running on the same hardware as your workload, there is an underlying isolation mechanism that's been put in place by the cloud provider to ensure that you can access my data and I can access your data. So if an attacker is able to bypass that isolation mechanism, that's when we have a cross tenant vulnerability. And essentially we're talking about vulnerabilities that leads to the compromise of other customers workloads. So essentially we've gone from headlines like what we have on the screen where um, different forecasters were talking about why we should not worry about cross tenant attacks to where we've now had about six cross tenant vulnerabilities in the Azure cloud just in the last one and a half years. So one of the key lessons that's come out from these vulnerabilities for me has been a better understanding of the Azure managed service isolation model. So this is something that the cloud providers have not always been very forthcoming in their documentation in terms of how have they implemented the isolation behind the scenes. But one of the things is the security researchers are beginning to test those and then beginning to uncover what some of those models that Microsoft has put in place behind the scene, what some of this looks like. So let's have a look at what some of this looks like. So um, here is a model where you have customer services and where you have um, the, a virtual machine or operating system isolation model. So each customer service run in an isolated virtual machine. So of course, this has a stronger security boundary than if we're using a container, but it's much more expensive to implement because now you're dedicating a whole virtual machine to a single customer, right? There's a lot of management overhead that the cloud provider has to look after also, even though there's a lot of automation that they use behind the scene. So services like the Azure Hub service, Azure Cache for Redis, um, Azure Container Instance, Azure Synapse, Azure Data Factory, leverage this type of isolation model. But in some cases, you see that this type of model is offered as a premium offering. So like in the case of Azure Cache for Redis, um, that's, that's sort of like the case. You have to go for the premium offering if you're going to um, use this model. So then we have another model um, here where um, in this case, it's still virtual machine that's used for the isolation. However, the customer is offered an option to have a further isolation in terms of the network layer, right? So in this case, the customer workload can be running in a private network that's managed by the customer and um, the service is running in there. It's connected to the central um, control plane of the, of the managed service itself. So again, this adds you know, another extra layer of isolation. So this is service isolation plus network isolation. So maybe you're using capabilities like VNet injection. So again, Azure um, App Service using Azure App Service environment offers that capability. So instead of us having our apps running in um, a shared network, we can have it run in a private network that's managed by us in terms of App Service environment. Azure SQL, we have Azure SQL managed instance. Again, Cash for Redis Premium offers us this capability. We have Azure Data Factory self-managed option. We have API management that gives us the option to host our resource in a private network. Um, of course, there are challenges to this. So some of the issues with this, again, when you're talking about um, this type of model 
is at number one attackers could look to maybe attack the network layer right so try to attack the network layer um, and try to cost, um, compromise other, other customers workload and some of the uh, vulnerability disclosure that's exactly what they did uh, was attack the network layer but another option is to try to attack stuff like the control plane so attacking the control plane to see if there's a vulnerability that could be exploited and then um, an attacker could pivot to other customers workload and this is where the model of the network isolation model can be sort of a little bit more dangerous right so again we saw this with um, one of the vulnerabilities that affected um, Azure data factory so where if you're actually running that in your private network um, and if um, something was breached in the managed control plane. Essentially, this could be leveraged as sort of like a command and control center to get um, a resource that's hosted in your private network to run commands um, directly against other resources within your private network. So there's a little bit of risk that's involved with that. So just keep that in mind. So again, these are example services that use this, this model. So another popular model that you're going to see is we have um, something like shared virtual machine with process isolation. So this is where you have multiple customer workloads sharing the same virtual machine, but then you have process isolation. So service like Azure Automation Account uses this model. So this was uncovered in one of the vulnerabilities where um, the automation account um, essentially what's used to steal tokens that belongs to other customers, right? Because they were essentially running on the same virtual machine for multiple customers and by modifying the port number they were able to have the at least the security researcher was able to harvest tokens or access tokens that belong to another customer so we have another model here where we have a container based isolation model where in this case you have shared virtual machine but then there's an um, a, a extra layer of isolation in terms of container isolation. So services that use this sort of model, we have, you know, Hydro, SQL, the hyperscale tier, leverage this sort of model because they run within containers. You have Azure database for PostgreSQL, the flexible server tier, you have Cloud Shell that leverage this sort of model. And this is a very interesting one in terms of um, an isolation model that's offered in some cases when we're having exceptions to setting Azure services. So you may have seen like some of those options where you know, you're know configuring your service in Azure and it says, do you want to add an exception for to allow Azure portal, to allow queries from the Azure portal? So you could probably do this for something like Cosmos DB, um, for maybe Azure SQL database. Um, Azure Cognitive Search is one of the services that allows us to sort of like leverage this model so this was what, what was actually discovered with the access uh, vulnerability. So cognitive search leverages this model. So it has a network proxy that it uses to make queries on behalf of Azure portal to the customer service. But in the case of that vulnerability, the attack, the um, security researcher uh, found out that essentially if they have an access token that belong to any Azure customer, essentially, you can make a call through that network proxy to access the data of any customer. So, which wasn't very, which wasn't very good, obviously. So, but one of the things that I also like us to keep in mind is that um, compliance is not security. So, a lot of the services that have been impacted with some of these um, cross-tenant vulnerabilities actually have compliance certificates, right? So, it's a very good question by Jess Ombu, the author of um, the wonderful book on release engineering, where he was talking about, you know, compliance around FedRAM for services like Azure Container Instances, Azure Cosmos DB, but then you have some of the services being impacted with some of this vulnerability. Again, keep in mind that compliance does not always mean security. So I think that's one of the issues is that in some cases, things have been marketed in such a way to, to make it sound as if, if you have a compliance certificate, it automatically means that uh, all the processes behind the scene are all fully secure and they're, they're um, feature-proof against any type of attack. That's not always the case, obviously. Okay, so let's talk very quickly about some Azure Cloud Thread Actors. So if you want to follow up on this, I would recommend you visit unit42.paloautonetworks.com forward slash atoms. 
Um, so just follow along in terms of some of the thread actors that our Unit 42 team um, are tracking. So in terms of cloud thread actors, I'll just make a quick mention of some of them. So we've had cloud thread actors like Team TNT. So um, they are known to actively target cloud credentials. So actually more recently, I believe like last week we released a report that followed some of the cases in terms of harvesting cloud credentials. We're seeing more of those cases. So that's something that um, organization really need to pay attention to. So the very sophisticated in terms of cloud identity, enumeration and credential scaping and scraping. So what they've done is if they have an establishment of IRC botnet and um, they, they specialize in hijacking compromised cloud credentials, maybe credentials that are attached to cloud workloads um, like um, virtual machines or other services that may be public. Again, you want to get some information, visit the URL that I shared with you earlier. So another cloud threat actor um, is Watchdog. So Watchdog, um, they seem to really specialize in using Go scripts to look for cloud credentials on compromised hosts. So credentials that maybe have been, have been associated with certain um, cloud hosts that have been compromised. So um, again, if you want to follow along in terms of the tracking and in terms of understanding the um, tactics, the, um, the TTPs, that, that we've, we've identified in terms of the unit for Tizuti at Palo Alto Networks, follow along with the URL that I shared with you earlier. So another cloud threat actor is Kinsing. So Kinsing, the target, um, the, the target exposed Docker Daemon APIs, they use Golang-based malicious processes that run on Ubuntu containers, and their main motivation seems to be more financial. So again, in terms of their tactics, um, the threat and the procedures, so you can follow along in terms of the URL that I shared with you earlier. And this is a very interesting one in terms of uh, the Red Lily, which research teams at Checkmax, JFrog, Sonatype have done a great work of tracking this group and their activities. So this group have been involved in, in supply chain substitution attacks. That's also called dependency confusion attack. So they specifically target Azure environment and they try to compromise the node um, package manager packages and uh, essentially trick customers into installing malicious packages in their dev environment. And then from there, they can look to um, maybe exfiltrate credentials that they could use in other types of attacks. Okay, so another key lesson that's really come up is around identity and access being the first line of defense when we talk about Azure security. So one of the things that you're going to see from some of the advisories from Microsoft on some of these vulnerabilities are advisories like this. Encourage the use of role-based access control, making sure that you avoid um, actions that have a wildcard, making sure that you regularly schedule key rotations. So you're gonna have like this sort of advice service, which are actual quotations from Microsoft in terms of their advisories in response to some of the vulnerabilities that I talked about earlier. So what this is showing us is that identity security is a really key area when it comes to securing our Azure environment. It's very important. So actually, if you look at um, the Cloud Security Alliance, if you look at um, the cloud computing threats that they announced for this year, identity, credential access, key management actually moved from number four last year to number one this year. So it's a very, very important aspect that we need to pay attention to. But this is also an area that organizations struggle with. So I'll share some data with you around this. So for example, if you have a look at um, azure.permissions.cloud, so shout out to Hayan McKay for putting out this website and doing the amazing job of maintaining it. So, and if you track sort of the permissions that um, has been announced to the Azure Cloud. So it currently stands at 16,210 permissions that exist. That's a lot of permissions. And what I actually did was I have like some scripts that I run on top of the information from Ian's GitHub repository to uncover some of this information that I have on the screen here. So um, this is actually based on some scripts that I run. 
So in the last 12 months alone, there have been 60 new built-in roles that has been announced for the Azure Cloud Platform. And there's been over 2,700 new permissions in 12 months. That's a massive scope that we're talking about. How many organizations have security teams that have the capability to take on this sort of changes and to understand the security implications for all of these new roles and all of these new permissions that have been added to the Azure Cloud Platform just in the last 12 months. And at Unit 42, we actually did a research where we analyzed, uh, where our teams at Unit 42 again analyzed close to 700,000 cloud identities in about 18,000 cloud accounts across 200 organizations. And what we found um, was very interesting in terms of identity and access. So we saw a lot of insecure hiring practices at organizations. So organizations having a lot of permission assignments that excessive. And you see like some of the reasons for that. So if you have a look at the way that Azure permissions work, for example, you have, uh, we use role assignments to assign permissions in Azure. So you have the Azure AD tenant where we have our security principles like our users, our service principles and managed identities. We have a role definition that defines the permissions that we want to assign. And then we have the scope that defines the management hierarchy that we want to assign the permission hat. We bring the three together in our role assignment. But one of the things that the Unit 42 research found was that for many organizations, they are relying massively on built-in roles that are created by Microsoft when they are assigning permissions. Is there any issues with that? Yes, there's a lot of issues with that because built-in roles are usually they have a broader scope. So only about 13.1% of permissions that are assigned are assigned with custom roles. So, and if you have a look at comparing the permissions, the number of permissions that exist in built-in roles versus custom roles, what the Unit 42 research found was that um, built-in roles have almost twice as much permissions contained in them than custom role assignments that customers are creating. And then if you take that further to have a look and see what exactly has been assigned and what is being used. What the research found was that only about 0.83% of permissions in built-in roles, uh, built-in role assignments are actually being used. So think about that. Right, that's a massive number of permissions that has been assigned that are not used. And when it comes to custom role, we're not doing any better because with custom role assignment, only about 1.77% is actually being used. That's not great, right? So, um, essentially, what we have with custom roles is that we're not actually doing better with custom roles in terms of how we are assigning permissions. That's why organizations will want to check out capabilities around um, things like CIEM in terms of managing this challenge. And again, we have an amazing um, um, CIEM capability for Azure um, in our Prisma Cloud um, platform uh, for code to cloud security. So one of the very interesting things that also came out from this research are the most popular role assignment for Azure. So the most popular role assignment for Azure, the top five are the ones that you have on the left-hand side. So you have storage blob, data contributor, virtual machine contributor, billing reader, contributor, and owner. And actually, if you have a look at it, all of these um, roles that people are using for permission assignment in terms of the top five, all of them have permissions in them that could be abused by an attacker to do really damage in terms of like the environment. So all the permissions that you have on the screen right here are permissions that are associated with those top five roles that could be abused. So you have permissions that could be abused for recon. So for example, you're talking about the billing reader role, right? There's a lot of uh, information that an attacker could get from that in terms of what resources are you using? What services are you using? What regions are you using? 
So that could give an attacker a lot of very, very useful information. You know, Microsoft .consumption, um API. So you have um, things like the Microsoft Management Group that can help an, an attacker to understand your resource hierarchy. Microsoft .authorization, um forward slash read that could allow an attacker to understand who has access to what within your environment. Um, so things like Microsoft um, dot compute virtual machine run command and serial ports um, connect action that could allow, allow an attacker to run code within virtual machines. So um, permissions like um, Microsoft dot cache list keys or maybe key vault get secrets that could be used by an attacker to harvest credentials within the environment or permissions like Bastion create shareable links, which is a new um, permission that's that I believe it's still in preview. So that could allow an attacker to, to establish persistence within the environment. So let's just be a bit careful in terms of the roles that we are assigning. So speaking about that, one of the things that we want to start looking at in terms of securing identity and access is that capabilities like identity protection, conditional access for workload identities are becoming much more important, not only for user identities, but also for workload identities. So both of these capabilities are currently in public preview. I need to check if they recently became generally available. So, but what identity protection would do, for example, is that uh, it can leverage threat intelligence in terms of identifying suspicious signing, using workload identities in terms of service principles, managed identities, right? Are those identities leaked in um, external repositories? Um, is an admin confirmed that the account is compromised? Is there an unusual addition of credentials, which um, has been a pattern that we've seen in some breaches recently? So this can really help to identify and uncover some of those. And in terms of conditional access signals that are available for workload identities, we have locations, we have service principal risks. So these are some of the capabilities that Microsoft has announced in terms of responding to some of these. So another aspect that I want to talk about is that there's actually two new identity protection detections that Microsoft um, added that's not yet available for workload identities, but one that you want to watch out for when they become available for workload identities. And that's the ability for identity protection to detect anomalous tokens and token issuer anomaly. Now, what's that referring to? So anomalous tokens um, detection can help us to identify when they have a play attacks uh, in our environment. So for example, if an attacker has stolen um, an access token and they are trying to reuse that, anomalous token can detect the signal as to be unusual and then being able to flag that hub for us. Um, or maybe things like um, unexpected token lifetime, or maybe the token is being used from an unusual location, it can identify that. Right. So just keep in mind that these two identity protection detections are currently available for user identities, but they're not yet available for workload identities, but they're very interesting one just to keep an eye out um, for. So the other thing just to keep in mind uh, is that conditional access can be bypassed. So there are different techniques that an attacker can, can use to bypass conditional access. So a good example of that is maybe excluding an identity or group um, from a conditional access policy. So it's always a good practice for organization to exclude. So maybe their break glass account from conditional access to um, avoid locking themselves out. However, an attacker could also exploit that with the right level of permission to exclude an identity, so maybe to be able to evade, a, um, evade uh, your protection. So one of the things that we want to put in place is we want to monitor anything that's trying to exclude an identity for conditional access as a defense evasion technique. So also there are um, ways to sort of like abuse the policy state. So for example, an attacker could switch the policy state from being on and switch that off or switch it to report only. So that way the policy is not going to apply when they're making requests. Uh, or maybe just condition misconfiguration on our part. So maybe we've configured a policy. We are not, we've not put in place a block policy. So essentially we're allowing everything else, right? So maybe in terms of, um, again, maybe um, we've excluded certain types of devices that an attacker can then try to spoof that device in terms of the user agent. 
because we're excluding certain types of devices so maybe we're only applying the policy to windows and um, bypassing it is as simple as using a linux system right so um also things like locations proxy so if you're um, search, um if you're checking for things that are coming from a specific location can an attacker put, use the proxy in that location to try to bypass your defense so those are some of the ways that an attacker could use to bypass conditional access uh, of course all, all of token theft also comes into place here so all of token theft is where an attacker could um Essentially, if they have the access token, that's bypass conditional access because conditional access comes into place before the token is issued. So that's where the validation occurs. So um, Microsoft are, are doing interesting things these days around that to do continuous validation of the session token um, so that um, it, again, it's con constantly been validated. So an attacker, if they get access to maybe a local access key for a service or a local credential for a service, that bypasses um, any policy that you've configured in conditional access. So local credential access don't go through conditional access. So speaking about access key and local credential authentication, there are about 28 services in Azure that supports this. So, and we're talking about both long-lived access tokens in the case of services like Azure Storage Account, Cosmos DB, Azure Badge, or we're talking about even temporary access token like shared access signature tokens like Azure Disks or maybe even Azure Storage. So, and there are multiple services in Azure that supports this. And there are different avenues for compromise for these types of um, access if they are enabled in your environment. So maybe there's a cloud security provider flow like Chaos DB that allows an attacker to get a hold of some of these keys, or maybe there's, um, you're storing them in configuration like for Azure Hub service, or maybe you're storing them in Azure Hub configuration that an attacker has an identity that has permissions to that resource. Developers are storing them as um, variables in their pipelines. You're putting them in a file in Azure Blob Storage so those are multiple avenues for compromising these local access keys, depending on how you manage them. So that is the reason why we want to ensure that we have proper management of these local access keys in our environment. So some of the things that we want to look into includes the following. So look at the services that you're using in Azure. Are they one of those 28 services that support local access credentials? If the answer to that is yes, do they also support identity-based authentication? So in the case of Azure Cosmos DB, you may find out that APIs like the SQL APIs support identity-based authentication, but APIs like MongoDB or Gremlin may not support a, a central identity-based authentication that's linked up with something like Azure AD or Cassandra, for example. If the answer to that is yes, does that work for your use case? Because in some cases, what you may find is that if you switch over to identity-based authentication, maybe you lose certain functionality. So you have to check, does it work for your use case? If the answer to that is yes, can you disable local authentication? If the answer to that is yes, disable local authentication, use only identity-based authentication. But if identity-based authentication is not supported for the service, or if, Identity-based authentication does not work for your use case. Maybe you lose certain functionality or if it cannot be disabled, then you have to look for ways to mitigate the risks. And one of the ways to do that is to begin to look for avenues to add an additional layer of protection. In this case, look for opportunities to do private network access. So these keys can only be used from a private, essentially trusted networking code. So, if you don't lose any functionality by using private network access, go ahead and implement private network access. So if you lose functionality by implementing private network access, at least look to restrict the network access. The other thing that you also want to start checking is that if your service supports local access key or local user credential, can you assign an identity to it? Because that could be an avenue for an attacker to pivot into other areas of your environment. So if the service can be assigned an identity, you have to treat it as an escalated risk. So if it does, 
implement least privileged access for that identity that's associated with that service. So we talked about some cloud threat actors that are getting really good at harvesting cloud credentials. So this is some of the places where you need to start implementing some of those protection. The risk even increases further if the service supports assigning an identity to it and the service supports executing user provided code. So if there's a remote code execution, an attacker could execute code on within the service, address the credential, and then reuse the credential in your environment. If the answer to that is yes, also think about implementing monitoring to be able to identify these sort of issues within your environment. The other thing that we also want to put in place is we want to ensure that going forward, we begin to factor in that there will be vulnerabilities and there will be custom and vulnerabilities on the side of a cloud provider. So we want to start practicing the principle that I call zero trust with zero exceptions. So, and what that means is that, is that even trusted entities like our cloud providers, we need to treat them um, as being, uh, we have to assume breach. We have to assume that there will be custom and vulnerabilities on their side and we need to start putting extra layers of isolation between the cloud provider's platform and our workloads that we are running on that platform. So when we talk about practicing zero trust principles, we have principles like verifying explicitly, uh, making sure that we are authenticating and authorizing based on multiple data points, not just a single data point, making sure that we're following the principle of least privileged access, making sure that in this case, we are assuming there will be custom and vulnerabilities and we're looking for opportunities to minimize the blast radius if something like that were to happen or to segment access um, to other highly sensitive areas of our environment if something like that were to happen. But how do we implement that? Well, we need to start thinking about implementing extra layers of isolation and adding between, again, the cloud provider and our workloads. And the other thing that we need to start thinking about is implementing capabilities to contain and detect threats if, let's say, the service control plane on the side of the cloud provider were to be breached um, by maybe a, a, bad, a threat actor, for example. Runtime protection is important. That's sort of like our last line of defense, so detecting anomalies looking at what signals are coming from the cloud provider side and detecting anything that's unusual. Why is the cloud provider's um, service control plane asking my agent to run a PowerShell command? So that should be unusual. That should flag up um, something within your environment. Some of the ways that we can begin to implement this zero trust and practice that, extending that to our cloud provider is leveraging client-side encryption. So making sure that our application or our service is encrypting data before we are storing data within the services offered by a cloud provider. So we have capabilities like Azure Always Encrypted for Azure SQL Database for Azure Cosmos DB. In the case of Cosmos DB, if I have my data in the Cosmos DB, in the Cosmos DB resource, I can create key vault resource and create a customer managed key in a key vault resource. Now, when my application uh, with my application, I can generate a data encryption key, which is the actual key that I'll be using to encrypt my data. But before the key is used to encrypt my data, I can wrap the key with a customer managed key that's stored in Key Vault. And then that key can then be used to encrypt my data. In the case of what happened with Chaos DB, let's say the Microsoft Internal Management Service were to be compromised by an attacker they still won't be able to access my data because my data was encrypted before it's stored in the service. So this is something that we can implement um, in code. So there's an example of implementing that in code um, using the um, .NET um, Cosmos DB client library. In this case, we have the properties. So we have the client encryption key ID that we are specifying here. We have the encryption algorithm that we want to use. We have the encryption type that we are using. So in this case, deterministic, or we can also use randomized encryption. And in this case, we're specifying the path within our database that we want to encrypt. So I'll just show you a brief demonstration of that, not a full demonstration, but a brief demonstration of that.
So here's a quick example of that. If you have a look at this Cosmos DB database, if I go to the items from within the portal, you can see that all these um, paths within my data are all encrypted. So the other quantity, product ID, unit price, line total, all of those are all encrypted. And that is because that's the way that it's implemented within my application. So if I show you um, an example of what I talked about earlier, so in this case, that's the data, you know, implementing that. So that's the data encryption algorithm that we're using. So I'm pointing to a key that I have in key vault that it's going to use to wrap the data encryption key that it's going to generate. So that's what it's going to use. And in this case, I, I can also specify the path that I want to um, encrypt. In this case, I'm specifying I want to encrypt the subtotal path, which is the reason why if I go back to the portal, you see that um, any path that I've identified, like the subtotal, you can see that that's encrypted. The other dates, you can see that that's encrypted. So that's because I've identified the paths that I want to encrypt within my code. So the data is going to be encrypted before being stored in the code. Other areas that we can use to implement, that we can look to implement zero trust with zero exceptions is to implement compute isolation. So Azure support isolated virtual machine sizes. So and these are virtual machine um, sizes that essentially they are isolated to a specific hardware type, which are dedicated to a single customer just because of their size. So um, that's one option. That's one way that we can use to implement compute isolation so that um, our workloads are running on isolated compute. So just keep in mind if you're using isolated virtual machine sizes, like some of the sizes that you have on the right hand side, they can go, they can be retired. So for example, you can see that some sizes were retired in 2021, some were retired earlier this year. So, and whenever they are retired, that size becomes non-isolated. So always keep up to date with what I, what's um, considered to be isolated virtual machine size and what's not considered to be an isolated virtual machine size. So another way to implement compute isolation um, for our workload is actually to get like a dedicated hardware. So dedicated host gives us hardware isolation at a physical level in Azure. So, and this is supported for virtual machines in Azure. So we can have dedicated hardware to run our virtual machines in Azure. It's supported for um, virtual machine skill set and also for Azure Hub service. And the other thing I, that I mentioned in terms of zero trust with zero ex, uh, um, exceptions is that we want to ensure that we are also monitoring for signals that are coming from the service control plane of a cloud provider. So you're using something like Azure Hack. What exactly is the Azure Hack agent doing on your systems? So um, you should have detections to be monitoring that. Like in the case of the Synlabs vulnerability, where an agent um, was installed in order to make it like a, an integration runtime environment for data factory. But then because of the service control plane was compromised, that could be used to run commands on connected hosts. So you need to be looking at what commands are this cloud middleware running within my environment. And there are a lot of cloud middleware that are out there. So you have Azure Linux virtual machine extension, Azure hack agents, like I mentioned, you know, virtual machine snapshot agent, virtual machine access agent, dependency agent. You have tons of this cloud middleware. You need to start monitoring in terms of exactly what are these agents doing within my environment. Also, we need to start normalizing private access for cloud services. So we need to start leveraging capabilities like private endpoints, which is currently supported by about 47 services in Azure. So, but just keep in mind that private endpoint applies to ingress traffic only. So you don't have a private egress um, for if you're just using private endpoint. Also keep in mind that in some cases, when we enable private endpoint, it's going to automatically restrict public access, but in some cases it does not do that. So it automatically restricts public access only if we're implementing that for Azure Hub service and Azure functions. For the others, it does not automatically restrict public access. That's an additional configuration that we are responsible for that we need to do. So um, there is an, a cost implication for private endpoints. So in the case um, of both ingress and egress, 
there's an additional cost for that. And there is network security group, which allows us to be able to um, add even further isolation for um, private endpoints. So talking about additional level layer of isolation, so VNet integration is something else that we can look into. So this actually allows us to take a platform service and put it in a private virtual network subnet in Azure. So unlike private endpoints, this actually is supported for both ingress and egress traffic. And it's currently supported by about 23 services in Azure. Just keep in mind that in most of the cases, you need dedicated subnet for most of the services. So you need to have a very scalable um, virtual network and you have to uh, implement your IP addressing scheme to allow you to have multiple subnets that you can use for some of the services. And for some of these services, if you're going to be implementing VNet integration, um, you have to be paying the pre for, for the premium tier if you're going to be doing that. So in the case of Azure Cash for Redis, that's the case. So this one is a very interesting one that many people may not know exists, but it actually exists. The Azure Control Plane itself, Azure Resource Manager can actually be accessed privately. So Microsoft added two new resource types. So we have the resource management private link. We have the private link association. So both of them under the Microsoft authorization namespace. So we can apply that at the root management group level. And that allows us to be able to make API calls to Azure Resource Manage, uh, Manager via a private IP address. So at the moment, only private connectivity is supported. Network isolation is not yet supported. I am guessing Microsoft are con <laughs> concerned about people accidentally locking themselves out. So however, I'm hoping that this is something that they're going to extend to network isolation because that brings in very interesting scenarios for organizations that require that high level of compliance within their environment. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank you very much for staying with me and for watching this episode. Thanks very much for watching um, this episode of the Azure Festive Tech Calendar. Hopefully you got one or two useful things from um, this. So again, feel free to reach out to me on social media. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with me. I'm always doing stuff in the Azure Cloud community. I have an Azure Cloud Security Meetup group that I host. We'll be having amazing events next year. Check out our Cloud Security Solutions at Palo Alto Networks. Again, I believe that we have the most comprehensive um, code to cloud platform out there for the Azure cloud, but also for other cloud platforms that are out there. But again, thanks very much for sticking with me throughout this episode. Have a lovely holiday season and have an amazing 2023. Bye for now.